It used to be said that facts speak for themselves. This is, of course, untrue. The facts speak only when the historian calls on them. It is he who decides to which facts to give the floor and in what order or context. Everyone knows what monsters the mad Egyptians worship. Blue Jay isn't racist, I should be clear. I mean, I probably, he's probably not racist. I mean, I'm racist, who cares? Continuity. The fact is that Blue Jay gave the floor to someone he shouldn't have. This has happened to, I think, every amateur historian with a cartoon profile picture. This person he gave the floor to, to be clear, was not Nathan Bedford Forrest. It was an ancient historian. It would be difficult to recognize what exactly was going on unless you possessed an encyclopedic knowledge on ancient Roman racism. Blue Jay made an honest mistake. You know, this is not gonna be 20, 30 minutes of me just, you know, attacking the guy. It's a very small claim and a very small error. But I think what's more important though is that the mistake that Blue Jay made wasn't just honest. It was very interesting. For those of you that don't know, Blue Jay does what I do. He makes cute little edutainment videos on history. Except where Blue Jay combines a dark sense of humor with an affable mascot, resulting in a delightful tonal contrast. I just sound like I'm genuinely mad that you're here. Wish you would leave. And I seem to find a sexual thrill in having the most inappropriate emotional reaction imaginable to historical events. I have described my ritualistic foreskin bloodletting as a vibe, and the Roman holiday where they crucify dogs as probably deserved. Blue Jay, in his video, Wacky War Tactics in Another Nutshell, discusses the Battle of Pelusium and cites an article hosted on the official sounding World History Encyclopedia written by Joshua J. Mark. We'll get into who Joshua J. Mark is drawing this story from as that's where the problem is here. This battle is widely regarded as a decisive battle in the war between Egypt and Persia, which would lead to Egypt losing their independence to Persia and then Alexander, then the Ptolemies, then those Italians showed up, and Eurocentric yada yada yada, Egypt would not be ruled by an Egyptian until the 1960s. Anyway, the Battle of Pelusium is important, not only because it was such a decisive battle and such an important war to history as a whole, but also because, according to Blue Jay and World History Encyclopedia, the Persians defeated the Egyptians Ew. with cats. During the battle, the Persian king, Cambyses II, decided to exploit that goofy-ass Egyptian religion by painting his soldiers' shields with the image of Bastet, the cat lady god, and also, you know, just flooding the battlefield with cats. This is sometimes cited as the first historical example of psychological warfare, and it would result in a decisive Persian victory, as the Egyptians cast down their weapons, unwilling to strike the image and avatars of their goddess. So where is World History Encyclopedia getting this from? Polyenus, who, inexplicably, is not a mythical Greek monster with 1,000 anuses, but is rather a Greco-Roman historian who lived in Macedon in the 2nd century AD. Polyenus wrote a collection of historical war stratagems for then co-emperors Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus. So let's see what exactly he said on the Battle of Pelusium. When Cambyses attacked Pelusium, which guarded the entrance into Egypt, the Egyptians defended it with great resolution. They advanced formidable engines against the besiegers and hurled missiles, stones, and fire at them from their catapults. To counter this destructive barrage, Cambyses ranged before his front line dogs, sheep, cats, ibises, and whatever other animals the Egyptians hold sacred. I'm sorry if you can hear a gun in the background, we're in Texas. The Egyptians immediately stopped their operations out of fear of hurting the animals which they hold in great veneration. Cambyses captured Pelusium and thereby opened up for himself the route in two, one second. <clears throat> Egypt, nothing about painting cats on shields. I can find no ancient source writing about painting cats on shields, despite the fact that World History Encyclopedia claimed that Polyenus said that. He didn't. It appears to be a widespread myth, but I cannot find its exact source, wherever it comes from. It is possible it came from a misunderstanding of a book written by wonderful author and, okay, Spider-Man, Tom Holland. As he wrote in his book, Persian Fire, that when the Persians finally met the Egyptians in battle, it is said that they did so with cats pinned to their shields, reducing their opponent's archers, for whom the animals were sacred, 
to a state of outraged paralysis. If you will check Tom Holland's citation for that claim, you will see that he's citing Polyenus exclusively on this point. So I guess we just sort of got to assume that Tom Holland is assuming the cats were pinned to shields because they're fucking cats. <laughs> like, they'd run away. It's a battle, and they're fucking cats. It, it's funny to me that the illustration on World History Encyclopedia's website shows the cats running fearlessly into fucking battle. So once again, to be very clear, Polyenus mentioned neither cats being pinned to shields nor being painted on shields. I can find no one who did, as I too could not find anyone else giving such a colorful account of the Battle of Pelusium. If you will return to Spider Twink's Persian history book with a title that I'm sort of jealous of, I wish I thought of it, you will see that in his citation he says, This story is found in the seventh book of Polyenus' Strategies, written in the second century AD. Perhaps a suspiciously late date. Perhaps! Polyenus is our earliest account of Cambyses filling the battlefield with animals. He was writing 700 years after the event. Th that's useless. You understand that, right? Hernan Cortez beat Montezuma to death with a rubber chicken. I'm the first guy to say that. It's been 500 years since the event transpired. It's safe to assume I'm just making things up. As far as I'm concerned, that is all I need. But there's a lot here when you dig into it. Cats are not emphasized whatsoever. They are one among many animals. Joshua J. Mark emphasizes that killing cats was considered, like, you know, totally, like, against Egyptian religion, but Cambyses II didn't fill the battlefield with cats. He filled it with animals, among which were, apparently, some cats. He didn't paint a shield with the image of Bastet, so why the fuck do you keep talking about Bastet? What about ibises? Ibises were in there. Why did you ignore the noble ibis, Josh? I can't believe I'm arguing with a guy named Josh. The reason for this mismatch between what the source is claiming and what Joshua J. Mark claimed is that we list, we just sort of, it's, it's fun. It's fun talking about how much Egyptians loved cats. And the Romans had a lot of fun talking about Egyptian attachment to animals too. It was sort of different and it sort of explains what happened. It is so fucking bright out here. I'm sorry if I'm squinting. I, I got fucking beer on, God damn it. Sorry. Cicero wrote, Who is there who is unacquainted with the customs of Egyptians? Their minds being tainted by harmful opinions, they are ready to bear any torture rather than hurt an ibis, a snake, a cat, a dog, or a crocodile. But of course, that is but a single example of Polyenus' absurd claim being rooted in Greco-Roman stereotypes about Egyptians rather than any sort of historical fact. That's right. We must become the most annoying people imaginable on the internet, digging through quite literally ancient writings to find people doing heckin' unwholesome racist wrong things. It's time to cancel Cicero. You know, I've heard rumors he's unvaccinated. Anyway, let's jump forward a few centuries and look. Sometimes as a historian, you have to go places you don't want to go. As truth seekers, we gotta, we gotta follow the path wherever it leads, right? So. I want you to be strong with me, keep your head on straight, and together, we are going to read poetry. Written by a conservative. Where the American flags at? Remember when people would- In juvenile satires, we see a comedic perspective on the Egyptians from a staunch Roman conservative, advocating for traditional Roman values and decrying the influence of stinky foreigners. So, this is the classical equivalent of one Egyptian townsfolks will venerate cats, another's freshwater fish, or they'll say their prayers to a dog. It is a sin to violate a leek or crunch an onion in your teeth. They abstain from woolly animals completely at their tables, and there it's a sin as well to slaughter a goat's offspring. But it's fine to feed on human flesh. Overall, it's, it's, it's not very nice to Egyptians, if you're getting that vibe. And lastly, this is going to be fast, I promise, in Virgil's motherfucking Aeneid. To be clear, the Aeneid was an epic poem of great cultural importance to Rome, as it was Rome's original character, Do Not Steal, to Homer's Sonic the Hedgehog 1 and 2. Regardless, the poem is very partial to the man in charge at the time, 
who was Octavian. And as you could imagine, Octavian didn't care very much for Egyptians. Virgil described the Egyptian pantheon as... Barking Anubis and monstrous gods of every kind. Let's really think about what we got here. We got a politician writing philosophy. We got a comedian, an anonymous comedian, that we don't know like who he actually was, uh, writing satire. And we have a like world, like a Virgil, I wanna be, I, I know you're, you're like me, you're just stinky weird guys, but Virgil is like, he's in Dante's Inferno, rated M for mature. The Egyptian fixation on animals, well, don't get me wrong, it did exist, but this was something the Romans really fixated on. They found it depraved, monstrous, and laughable. But despite the deep-seated Roman disgust of these backwards people and their animal gods, the Roman people would enthusiastically adopt one member of the Egyptian pantheon with gusto. But in order to bring this part of the argument to bear, I'm going to have to bury this video under some 10-hour video essays about iCarly or whatever the fuck as it's going to get me demonetized. Anyway, that god was... Isis. No, the other one. Isis was the Egyptian deity who would find widespread worship in the Roman Empire. It is so fucking bright out here, it is killing me. We're, I'm not going outside again. I, I, you go outside once in a year to film something, and it's the sun is out. It's fucking off Now, this is largely due to two qualities which she possessed, which, broadly speaking, the other Egyptian gods did not. Number one, she was not an ostrich, or whatever the fuck. And number two, she had been Hellenized over the centuries. The Greeks, in general, possessed a more favorable view of the Egyptians and their accomplishments. But to be clear, when I say Greeks, I mean Aristotle and Herodotus, who had been dead for centuries by the time of Polyenus. The whole LOL animal worship thing doesn't seem to come about until the late Republic, early Empire period. The reason I'm digging into the writers who preceded Paulinus is not just to establish a pattern of Romans mocking the sanctity of animals in Egyptian religion, but also to sort of highlight that if Pelusium really went down that way, the Romans would not stop talking about it. Like, Cato the Elder would have gotten it on a lower back tattoo. They would have loved that fucking story. It would be one of the most famous stories in all of history if someone even remotely credible actually said it. The big thing is that Paulinus stands alone. He stands alone 700 years after the battle. In fact, we have a more reputable description of the Battle of Pelusium from a more known quantity. A historian who explains their methods, investigates, and does the very sort of work that I'm claiming Paulinus did not. Here's the thing about history, kids. It's, you know, it's a hard truth. It's a cold truth. And it hurts innocent historians all around the world every day. Sometimes, Herodotus is the best source you have. May God have mercy on us all. Herodotus was writing 100 years after the Battle of Pelusium, whereas Polyenus was writing, as I've said, 700 years after. Furthermore, Polyenus, as far as I can tell, just sat down and wrote some shit for some imperial assholes. Herodotus visited the battlefield, he poked some fucking skeletons, and asked the locals themselves what happened. Herodotus's word should, as always, be taken with a grain of salt. But I don't think you should take Polyenus for uh, anything, like at all. What Polyenus wrote is absolutely not evidence of what happened at Pelusium. It's evidence of what the Romans thought about the Egyptians. Someone should really make a video about that. So I've got one more point I want to make even though I think at this point it's somewhat unnecessary, but I think it's neat. A lot of this stuff, I, all I had to do was say is 700 years after the fact, and I probably would have been fine, but it's just like a lot of this stuff is genuinely interesting, I think. So what I want to do is I want to read about a single body excavated from a single site, the old city of Sardis, which was sacked by the Persians, uh, specifically Cambyses II's father. So here is the description of the body. This was an older man, in his 40s, arthritic, and probably one of the inhabitants of the house. So, like, not a warrior, right? It used to be set. Where the fuck is it? 
Who would have possibly thought that a pile of loose papers being thrown around could get out of order? Only parts of the skeleton were preserved. The head, right arm, left hand, and both legs were all missing. Rip. Since this part of the house was not disturbed after the destruction, the missing limbs must have been removed in antiquity. Because the bones were so burned, it could not be determined whether the missing pieces were the result of deliberate mutilation, common in ancient warfare, or of having been carried off by dogs or other animals. But yeah, I mean, it's, you see the brutality of it, right? Like, you wouldn't just surrender, oh, it's, oh they got cats and that, no, it's, hold on. Shit, did I, I made a mistake actually here. Oh, shit, yeah, no, this is not, um, I didn't pick this body, this is not a random body, this is, uh, your mother. Your mother burned alive in her home and was eaten by dogs because you ran away due to your religious beliefs over uh, sheep or dogs or whatever the fuck. Your, your, your wife and children have been assaulted and enslaved. Your, your home was burned to the ground. You, everything that you have been, that your people are, you are just a jewel in the crown of a foreign despot who is, for generations, going to subjugate and exploit you and your uh, descendants. This story is ridiculous. When Paulinus wrote down that the Egyptians let that happen to themselves to avoid hurting animals, he was mocking them. He was mocking not only their religion, but their manhood and courage. Okay, I've made my points in a systematic, measured, reasonable, if hostile and unhinged manner. I've cited my sources. Improperly, because uh, that's fucking tedious. I've crossed my T's. I've dotted my I's. So I hope I've earned a single point which I can make just based purely on simple logic. I sort of made it earlier, but I feel like I really didn't just drive it home. Do you really think a bunch of animals in the middle of a battlefield aren't gonna instantly get the fuck out of there? It takes months, if not years, to make a man not instantly get the fuck out of there the second that shit starts flying. You're telling me that they sent the cats to basic training? I can't get my cat to sit on my fucking lap. That heartless bitch. How did they even get them there? Did they just, like, did they, they must have been in separate cages, right? Uh, unless they were literally herding cats. They must have been in separate fucking cages because they sure as shit were not all in the same cage. Polyunus' account of Pelusium is a lie. A lie which he either made up himself, or has the uh, dubious distinction of being the first guy to record this lie in writing. At least the first guy to record this lie in writing, which survived. Putting aside the logistical nightmare of bringing the fucking circus to battle, the absurd notion that these animals, which include literal fucking birds, would not immediately get the fuck out of there, like, it, it's just insane. Like, maybe they could have, like, kept them in cages in front of the front line, like the troops could be pushing the cages filled with animals. But like, that's, once again, I'm doing the work for the guy, and it, there's no reason to think he has any idea what the fuck he's talking about. Most importantly, we see in Herodotus a more, relatively speaking, reputable source who makes no mention of this Persian zoo shit. Herodotus focuses on the inexperience of the Egyptian pharaoh at the time to explain the swift fall of the city. He uh, also mentions the lack of support from Egypt's Greek allies, which is a pretty sketchy assertion in and of itself, but whatever. It's not ridiculous. Anyway, this is a long fucking video, and generally speaking, these long fucking videos that... I'm thinking about the thumbnail I'm gonna put now, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for that thumbnail. I couldn't resist it. Like, we should do a podcast, Blue Jay if you're still watching. Uh, you mentioned getting drinks with Trey the Explainer. We, we, we should all do a podcast. Like, I think it'd be fun. This is my job application. Uh, email me, please. Uh, I was banned from Twitter for reasons which I just don't have time to get into right now. Next video is a gaming video. Thanks for watching. Bye.